Ever since I can remember, life in our small Utah town felt like a scene straight out of an old western movie. Houses spaced miles apart, open fields as far as the eye could see, and the rocky mountains painting a distant, majestic backdrop. But for me, a 25-year-old who moved away long ago, it's not the beauty of this place that haunts my memories. It's something far more sinister. I was 17 then, a high schooler with more on my mind than just grades and girls. Home wasn't exactly my favorite place. Mom and Dad, well, let's just say we didn't see eye to eye on most things. That's why I spent most of my time at my best friend's house next door. His name was Mike, and he lived in a unique spot, right where our little town seemed to give up on growing. His house sat at the end of a cul-de-sac, a lonely sentinel overlooking the endless field that we jokingly called our backyard. Those fields, man, during the day they were nothing but stretches of dry grass swaying in the breeze, harmless and peaceful. But as night fell, they transformed into something else, something eerie. I remember the first time Mike and I heard it. We were up late, as usual, probably playing video games or watching some horror flick, trying to prove who was less scared. Then came the sound, a dragging, gargling noise that seemed to creep up from the back porch. Mike's room was in the basement, with a window that just peeked above ground, offering a view of the porch. We froze, eyes wide, each hoping the other would be brave enough to take a look. But neither of us did. Not that night. It was easier to tell ourselves it was just a stray animal, or the wind playing tricks. The noise came and went after that maybe a couple of times a month. We'd hear it, look at each other with that same mix of fear and curiosity, and eventually fall asleep without ever really checking. This went on for years, becoming a strange, unsettling part of our lives. We got braver, or maybe just more foolish. A few times we'd muster up the courage to rush to the window, peering into the darkness. But there was never anything there. Just the empty porch, bathed in moonlight, and the vast, quiet field beyond. Looking back, I realize how much those sounds shaped those high school years. They were like a dark cloud over our late-night laughs and whispered secrets. A reminder that not everything in our little town was as plain and simple as it seemed. I'd like to say we eventually solved the mystery, confronted whatever was making those noises. But we didn't. Not really. The sounds just stopped one day as mysteriously as they had started. And life went on, as it tends to do. But even now, years later and miles away, I can still hear that dragging, gargling sound in my dreams. It's funny how some things stick with you, how some fears, once planted, never really leave. That field with its endless expanse and hidden secrets still haunts me. I can't help but wonder what was out there, just beyond the reach of the porch light, I still remember that night as if it happened yesterday. It was the summer after our senior year, and everything was about to change. Mike was moving away for college, and our days of carefree adolescence were numbered. We decided to make the most of one of our last nights together, doing what we did best, staying up late, playing video games, and watching movies. The room was a mess of soda cans and pizza boxes, a testament to our teenage disregard for cleanliness. We were lost in the glow of the TV screen, the outside world forgotten. It must have been past midnight when Mike suggested, how about a music drive? It was our thing, cruising down the empty streets, blaring our favorite tunes, feeling like the kings of the world. We hopped into his old truck, the familiar creak of the doors like a soundtrack to our youth. The night was unusually dark, the stars hidden behind a veil of clouds. As we swung out of his driveway, Mike flicked on the high beams, the powerful lights cutting through the darkness and illuminating the field ahead. That's when we saw it. There, in the light's edge, was a figure that defied explanation. It was on all fours, but it was no animal I'd ever seen. Its limbs were too long, bending in unnatural ways, and its skin. It was pale, almost translucent, stretched tight over its bones. It looked like a person but grotesquely distorted, as if someone had taken a human form and twisted it into something nightmarish. But the face, 
That's what haunts me the most. Its jaw hung open unnaturally wide, like a snake preparing to swallow its prey. And its eyes, two black voids, seemed to absorb the light around them. They fixed on us for a moment that felt like an eternity. Then as quickly as it had appeared, the creature recoiled, scurrying backwards into the brush. The way it moved was unsettling, like watching a film in reverse. Mike and I sat there, paralyzed. Our hearts pounded in our ears, the only sound in the deafening silence. We stared at each other, wordless, the same question in our eyes. Had we really just seen that? We didn't speak much after that, the usual banter replaced by a heavy silence. The drive back was a blur. Once we were inside, we locked every door, barricaded ourselves in the basement. We didn't sleep that night. Instead, we sat there, guns in our hands, waiting for something, anything, but nothing came. That night changed something in us. We'd always joked about ghosts and monsters, but deep down, we never really believed. But after that night, belief wasn't a choice. It was a cold, hard reality that stared at us from the darkness of that field. We tried to rationalize it, to convince ourselves it was just a trick of the light or our imagination. But the fear in our eyes, the way our hands shook, told a different story. We knew what we saw, even if we couldn't explain it. I left that town not long after, but that night never left me. It lingered in my dreams, a constant reminder of the mysteries that lurk in the dark, unseen corners of the world. Years have passed since that terrifying night, but not a day goes by without it creeping into my thoughts. I moved away from that small Utah town, chasing dreams and a fresh start, yet the shadows of the past cling to me, unshakable. Whenever I return, which isn't often, the town feels different. The once familiar streets and the sprawling fields hold a sense of foreboding, but it's that field, the one behind Mike's old house, that really gets to me. It's just as vast and empty as it ever was, but now it feels like it's hiding something, watching me with unseen eyes. I can't explain it. I'm a logical person, or at least I like to think I am. Ghosts, monsters, the things that go bump in the night, they're just stories, right? But then I remember that night, the creature with its elongated limbs and gaping jaw, and doubt creeps in. Was it real? A trick of the light, perhaps? Or something else? Something beyond our understanding? Like a skinwalker? I've spent countless hours trying to rationalize what we saw. I've scoured the internet for explanations, delved into folklore, even talked to local historians. But nothing fits. Nothing makes sense. That image is burned into my mind. The creature's black, soulless eyes. Its almost human-like form. The way it moved. Mike and I don't talk about it much. It's like an unspoken agreement between us. When we do catch up, we stick to the safe topics. Work, family, the mundane details of everyday life. But there's always that unspoken question hanging in the air the memory of that night lurking in the background of our conversations. Sometimes, late at night, when the world is quiet, I find myself staring out into the darkness, half expecting to see it there, watching me. I know it's irrational, but fear isn't bound by logic. It's a primal, deep-seated thing that clings to you, coloring your perception of the world. I've tried to let it go, to move on and leave it in the past. But it's not that simple. It's like a puzzle with missing pieces, a story with no end. I want to understand, to find some kind of closure. But maybe some things aren't meant to be understood. Maybe some mysteries are better left unsolved. And so I live with it, this haunting, this unshakable feeling that there's more to the world than what meets the eye. That night changed me in ways I'm still trying to comprehend. It opened my eyes to the unknown, to the possibility that there are things out there beyond our understanding. As much as it scares me, it also fascinates me. It's a reminder that the world is a vast, mysterious place, full of wonders and horrors alike. And maybe, just maybe, that's okay. Maybe it's enough to accept that some things are beyond our control, beyond our comprehension. 
so I'll keep looking out into the night, half hoping, half fearing that I'll see something, and maybe one day I'll find my answers. But until then, I'll live with the mystery, with the haunting memory of that night in the field, and the knowledge that some things are better left in the shadows. The first thing that struck me about Glenrock State Park was its silence. It was a deep, enveloping quiet, the kind that makes your ears ring. I had just started as a park ranger here, eager to leave the noise of the city behind. But as I stood on the edge of a thick forest, with the smell of pine and earth filling my lungs, I realized this was a different world. I was breaking in my new boots on the trail when Dan, my fellow ranger, called me on the radio. His voice, usually calm and controlled, had an edge of urgency. We've got a situation, he said. A hiker's gone missing. Heather Ricks, young woman about 25, didn't check back from her hike. My heart skipped a beat. On my way, I responded, clipping the radio back to my belt. The sun was dipping low, casting long shadows between the trees. As I hurried back to the station, I couldn't help but feel a chill despite the warm evening air. Rachel, another ranger, was already at the station when I arrived. Her face was lined with worry. Heather's an experienced hiker, she said, spreading out a map on the hood of a patrol vehicle. She was on the Cedar Trail. It's easy terrain, well marked. She shouldn't have had any trouble. As the twilight deepened, we set out with flashlights and gear, our boots crunching on the gravel path. The forest seemed to close in around us, the towering pines like silent sentinels. Every snap of a twig underfoot made me jump. I tried to focus, remembering my training, but the weight of the situation pressed down on me. We found Heather's backpack first, discarded carelessly by the side of the trail. My gut clenched. This wasn't right. Heather's water bottle and a crumpled park map lay nearby. I picked up the map, noticing her planned route. There was something deliberate in the way her things were scattered as if someone, or something, wanted them to be found. We searched until the early hours, our voices calling out Heather's name swallowed by the vastness of the park. As dawn broke, we retreated, exhausted and empty-handed. Back at the station I sat alone, sipping bitter coffee, staring out at the thick fog that had rolled in overnight. Dan and Rachel were in the back, making calls, organizing search teams for the day. The forest felt different now, ominous, like it was hiding secrets. As the sun rose, burning off the mist, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were up against something we couldn't understand. I thought of Heather, out there alone, and a shiver ran down my spine. This was more than a missing hiker. There was something wrong in Glenrock State Park, and I was right in the middle of it. I stood up, setting my coffee cup down with a firm resolve. Whatever was happening here, I was going to get to the bottom of it. Heather's life, and perhaps our own, depended on it. The days following Heather's disappearance blurred together like a bad dream. Each morning, I'd wake up with a start, hoping it was all just a nightmare. But then I'd see my ranger badge, my uniform hanging on the chair, and the reality would hit me again. I was out on the trails every day, searching, probing, looking for anything that might lead us to Heather. The park, once a sanctuary of natural beauty, now felt like a labyrinth of secrets and shadows. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of eyes on me from the dense undergrowth. Dan and Rachel were just as relentless in the search. We'd become a tight-knit team, bound together by the shared mission of finding Heather. But as days turned into a week with no sign of her, our hope began to wane. One afternoon, as the sun cast a golden hue over the park, I stumbled upon a stream. It was odd, snaking through a part of the forest I thought I knew well. But there it was, a gentle babbling brook, not marked on any of our maps. I crouched down, dipping my hand in the water, expecting it to be cold. But it was warm, strangely warm for a stream in the middle of a forest. That evening, we gathered in the ranger station, poring over maps and reports. Rachel brought in a stack of missing persons files. Look at this, she said, 
spreading them out. Each file was a woman. Each had vanished in the park, all within the last few months. A chill ran down my spine. This wasn't just about Heather anymore. We were looking at a pattern, a sinister pattern that had gone unnoticed. As we delved deeper into the files, the forest outside seemed to press against the windows, an ever-present reminder of the unknown. I couldn't help but feel we were missing something, a piece of the puzzle hidden in the vast wilderness. The next day brought more eerie discoveries. We found more of Heather's belongings, carefully placed along a trail we had already searched. A scarf draped over a bush, a shoe perched on a rock. It was as if someone was playing a twisted game with us. That night, Rachel shared her theory. I think we might have a murderer in the park, she said quietly, her voice barely above a whisper. The words hung in the air like a dark cloud. Later, as I lay in my bunk, unable to sleep, I heard it. A low, mournful howling. It wasn't an animal. It was something else. Something otherworldly. I sat up, heart pounding, listening as it echoed through the forest. The next few days were a blur of searches, theories, and mounting fear. We were no longer just park rangers. We were hunters, searching for a predator in our midst. As I patrolled the trails, every rustle of leaves, every snap twig set me on edge. The park had become a stranger to me, a place of hidden dangers and unseen threats. I realized then, standing alone in the vast, whispering forest, that we were dealing with something beyond our understanding, and I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was out there was just getting started. The longer Heather remained missing, the more the park transformed in my eyes. What was once a haven of natural splendor now seemed like a vast, inscrutable entity, hiding secrets beneath its serene facade. The more we searched, the less we understood. Our routine was grueling, up at dawn, searching until dusk, then back to the station to pore over maps and notes. The strain was showing on all of us, especially Rachel. Her usual stoic demeanor had given way to a quiet, simmering anxiety. One morning, Dan didn't show up for the briefing. Concerned, I went to his cabin. The door was ajar. Inside, I found him sprawled on the floor, unconscious, with a deep gash on his head. Beside him lay Heather's hat, neatly placed as if to taunt us. My blood ran cold. We rushed him to the nearest hospital. The doctors said it was a miracle he was alive. Whoever, or whatever, did this to him was still out there, and now we knew they were dangerous. Back at the park, the atmosphere was charged with a palpable sense of dread. The rangers spoke in hushed tones, their eyes darting to the forest's edge. Reports of strange occurrences had escalated. Unexplained electromagnetic disturbances, bizarre animal behaviors, and a pervasive feeling of being watched. Late one evening, as Rachel and I reviewed the day's search, she confided in me. I've heard stories, she whispered, about skinwalkers, creatures of Native American legend. They can take the form of any animal, even a person. I wanted to dismiss it as superstition, but the forest had a way of making you believe in the unbelievable. The eerie howling at night, the warm stream, Dan's attack, it all defied rational explanation. Each day, we pushed deeper into the wilderness, but the park seemed to shift and change around us, revealing nothing. I began to feel like we were pawns in a game we didn't understand, played by a force as ancient and unfathomable as the land itself. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting the forest in an eerie twilight, I saw it. A figure, shadowy and indistinct, flitting between the trees. I gave chase, heart pounding, but it was like chasing a wisp of smoke, elusive, insubstantial. I returned to the station, breathless and shaken. What was happening in Glenrock State Park? Were we dealing with a human predator, or something far more sinister? As I lay in my bunk that night, the boundary between sleep and wakefulness blurred. I dreamt of the forest, of eyes glowing in the dark, of whispers carried on the wind. When I awoke, the dream clung to me like a second skin, leaving me unsettled. The days melded into one another, each bringing more questions than answers. We were no closer to finding Heather, 
And now, with Dan out of commission, our resources were stretched thin. The park, with its hidden streams and shifting shadows, seemed to mock our efforts. I realized then that we were not just searching for Heather or a perpetrator. We were battling the very essence of Glenrock State Park, a place where reality seemed to warp and twist into something dark and unknowable. The park was no longer just a backdrop for our search. It had become an active participant, a vast and enigmatic character in its own right. The strange occurrences escalated, each day bringing a new, inexplicable event that defied logic. I spent my days combing through the dense underbrush, my nights haunted by dreams of dark, unseen forces. The line between the real and the surreal was blurring, and I found myself questioning everything. Rachel and I were the core of the search team now, with Dan still recuperating. We pushed deeper into the park's heart, driven by a mixture of fear and determination. Each clue we uncovered only deepened the mystery, leading us further into the unknown. One morning, as the mist hung low over the trees, we discovered a series of strange markings on a group of ancient oaks. They were unlike any animal scratches or natural wear I'd ever seen. The patterns were deliberate, almost ritualistic. It was as if the trees themselves were trying to communicate. The clues were perplexing. We found footprints that seemed to belong to no known animal, strange symbols etched into the ground, and areas where the very air felt charged with an unseen energy. Each discovery left us with more questions than answers. As we pieced together the fragments of the puzzle, a chilling picture began to emerge. The disappearances, the strange phenomena, they all seemed to be connected, but how? One evening, as the sun set in a blaze of crimson and gold, we made a startling discovery. In a secluded glen, we found what appeared to be a makeshift altar, adorned with bizarre totems and surrounded by a circle of stones. The air around it was heavy, charged with a palpable sense of dread. That night, back at the station, Rachel and I pored over the park's history, searching for any clue that might explain what we had found. The park's past was steeped in local lore and legend, tales of spirits and creatures that roamed the forest, but nothing concrete enough to serve as a lead. The following days were a tense mix of trepidation and resolve. We knew we were close to something, a revelation that could unravel the mystery. Yet, there was a part of me that feared what we might find. Then, on a crisp morning, with the first light of dawn filtering through the trees, we found another clue, a photograph partially buried under a pile of leaves. It was old, faded, but unmistakably a picture of the park. On the back, scrawled in hasty handwriting, were the words, They are watching. The photograph was a tangible link to the past, a piece of the puzzle that hinted at a history we had yet to uncover. It was a breakthrough but it left me with an overwhelming sense of foreboding. What were we dealing with? A human threat? Or something beyond our understanding? As the days passed, the park revealed its secrets and fragments, like pieces of a shattered mirror. Each piece reflected a part of the truth, yet the full picture remained elusive. We were no longer just searching for Heather or a culprit. We were delving into the heart of Glenrock State Park itself, a place shrouded in mystery and darkness. And as we ventured further, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not the hunters, but the hunted. The days had turned into a relentless march of tension and uncertainty. Glenrock State Park, once a place of tranquility, had become a maze of fear and mystery. Each step we took seemed to draw us deeper into an abyss of the unknown. Rachel and I had become shadows of ourselves, driven by a relentless need to find the truth. The park was no longer just a setting for our search. It had become an entity, a living, breathing presence that seemed to watch our every move. We followed the trail of clues with dogged determination, each one leading us further into the heart of the park. The photograph with its cryptic message had opened a floodgate of possibilities, each more unsettling than the last. Then, one foggy morning, as the first light filtered through the trees, we stumbled upon something that changed everything. In a clearing, shrouded in mist, lay a set of old rusted tools and a diary, its pages yellowed with age. 
The diary belonged to a former park ranger, and as I read the shaky handwriting, a cold realization washed over me. The ranger had written of strange occurrences, of shadows that moved in the night and whispers on the wind. He spoke of a presence in the park, something ancient and malevolent that had been there long before the park was established. The diary ended abruptly with a final chilling entry. They are here and they are watching. It was the connection we had been searching for, the missing piece that linked the past to the present, the disappearances, the strange phenomena, the feeling of being watched. It all stemmed from something deeply rooted in the park's history. As we delved deeper into the investigation, the line between reality and superstition blurred. We uncovered more about the park's past, tales of lost travelers and unexplained events that had been dismissed as folklore. But now, they took on a new significance. The climax came on a night when the moon was just a sliver in the sky. We had set out to explore a part of the park where the electromagnetic disturbances had been strongest. There, in the heart of the forest, we encountered something that defied explanation. It was a figure, ethereal and shifting, like a wisp of smoke. It moved with an eerie grace, vanishing and reappearing amongst the trees. We chased it, hearts pounding, but it was like chasing a shadow. In the end, we never found Heather, nor did we come face to face with whatever haunted the park. But the experience left us with a profound sense of unease, a feeling that some mysteries are better left unsolved. As I write this, sitting in the ranger station and looking out at the dark, whispering forest, I know that Glenrock State Park holds secrets that go beyond the realm of understanding. The park is alive with a presence that watches, waits, and remembers. We may never know the full truth of what happened to Heather and the others, but one thing is certain. The park is more than just a wilderness. It's a place where the line between the natural and the supernatural is forever blurred. A place that reminds us that some mysteries are not meant to be unraveled. The warmth of the sun had begun to fade by the time Melissa and I arrived at the campsite. Located within one of the oldest forests in our state, we had selected the site primarily due to our shared love of exploration and the outdoors. The air carried a crispness that tickled our senses, and the familiar scent of pine enveloped us, reassuring us that we were deep in nature's embrace. With eager anticipation, we set about pitching our tent the fabric rustling in the gentle breeze. The dancing flames of our well-lit fire illuminated our surroundings, casting flickering shadows that danced across the nearby trees. As the crackling fire glowed in the darkness, we felt a surge of excitement coursing through our veins. The allure of the unknown beckoned to us, fueling our desire to explore the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of the woods. Leaving the safety of our campsite behind, we ventured into the enigmatic forest, our senses heightened by our anticipation of the adventures that awaited. The serenity of our surroundings gradually gave way to a sense of awe as we marveled at the towering trees, their branches intertwining above us, creating a canopy that obscured the sky. Each step we took, the crunch of fallen leaves beneath our feet echoed through the silent woods. The twilight hours cast a mystical aura over our journey, the fading light painting long, haunting shadows across our path. An uneasy tension settled over our shoulders as the silence of the woods began to buzz with an indiscernible energy. Nervous glances were exchanged between us and vague whispers of discomfort danced on our lips. Melissa's grip on my hand tightened, mirroring the rapid rhythm of my heart. In hushed voices, we attempted to reassure ourselves that our unease was merely a product of overactive imaginations. But every rustle in the underbrush Every snap of a twig pushed that reassurance further from our grasp. The vastness of the ancient woods started to transform from a source of excitement to a labyrinth of anxiety. The looming silhouettes of gnarled tree trunks and twisted branches became an obstacle course, challenging us to find our way. We concentrated on retracing our steps, following the trail markers that had helped us navigate the woods in the past. But this time, they seemed deceitful mischievous even, 
as they led us astray. Doubt began to creep into our thoughts, seeping through the cracks in our confidence. Panic knotted in the pit of my stomach as it became apparent that we had lost our way. A shiver ran down my spine as our surroundings began to blur, each tree resembling the next, leaving us disoriented and trapped amidst the foreboding wilderness. Melissa's voice quivered with concern, her eyes searching for any signs of our campsite. Even the comforting warmth of our fire felt leagues away. As night began to blanket the forest, stars began to twinkle overhead. But instead of offering solace, they seemed to mock us, distant and indifferent to our struggles. Fear wrapped its icy fingers around our throats, squeezing the last remnants of confidence from our minds. Though we stood side by side, our once unyielding bond now wavered in the face of uncertainty. The forest, once a place of wonder and adventure, had transformed into an oppressive maze that swallowed our hopes and dreams. We knew we had to find a way out, to escape this claustrophobic nightmare. But where could we turn when every direction seemed equally foreign? Each path we chose led us in circles, deepening our feeling of entrapment. Desperation settled in as the realization dawned on us that we were truly lost. The darkness, once a mere backdrop to our exploration, now became an accomplice to our fear, concealing unknown dangers that lurked at every turn. As the moon gently cast its pale glow upon our disheartened figures, casting ethereal shadows that flickered like specters, we couldn't escape the nagging sensation that something else was out there with us. Our hearts raced as we realized that we were not alone in this forest of shadows. Unseen eyes bore into our souls, making every hair on our necks stand on end. The presence of an unknown force grew stronger, its intentions ambiguously threatening. We took tentative steps forward, our senses on high alert, our minds consumed by the eerie aura that pervaded the woods. The once harmonious symphony of nocturnal creatures was replaced by an unsettling silence. It was in that tense moment that we felt the first true whispers of danger. The inescapable feeling that something sinister lurked concealed in the darkness, stalking us with vicious intent. With every crackle of the underbrush, our apprehension grew, as did our resolve to find a way back to safety. Melissa's hand trembled in mine as her fearful gaze searched for any sign of familiarity, any flicker of hope in this labyrinth of despair. We moved forward hesitantly, like prey sensing the approach of a predator, our steps measured and cautious. But in this newfound depth of darkness, certainty became elusive, and every path seemed to lead us further into the unknown. With no alternative but to keep pushing forward, we pressed on, our determination masking the raw fear that had taken hold of us. The night grew deeper, the blanket of darkness enveloping us in its cold embrace. I could hear the pounding of my heartbeat in my ears, the rhythm becoming one with the ominous silence that enveloped our surroundings. The woods seemed to pulsate with an unnatural energy, a presence that whispered tales of the unknown and invoked a primal fear deep within us. Every rustle of leaves, every gust of wind felt like a prelude to something unimaginable. We were no longer explorers reveling in the thrill of adventure. We had become unwitting participants in a tale that would forever alter the fabric of our reality. As time blurred, the shadows deepened, and the edge between reality and nightmare was fractured. We became mere fragments of what we once were, worn down by the unyielding impediments of the forest and the unspoken specters that haunted us. Yet, as despair threatened to consume us, a flicker of light pierced the suffocating veil of darkness, emerging as a distant glimmer of hope amidst the encroaching threat. Night had fully descended upon the woods, engulfing Melissa and me in its inky embrace. Each passing moment intensified the eerie ambiance of the forest, amplifying our growing sense of unease. The trees, once majestic and welcoming, now loomed over us with an ominous presence. Their twisted branches seemed to reach out like skeletal fingers, as if eager to ensnare us within their cold grasp. With careful steps, we navigated the obscure paths that wound through the unfamiliar terrain. The trail markers that had once served as our guiding beacon now betrayed us, leading us astray with their deceitful directions. Our footsteps wavered, 
our confidence quickly eroding as anxiety and doubt gnawed at our minds. Every sound, no matter how distant or faint, echoed with dreadful resonance in the oppressive silence. The rustling of leaves morphed into wicked whispers, as if unseen creatures sought to communicate their sinister intentions. The woods seemed to come alive with a malicious sentience, conspiring against our very existence. Lost in the disorienting maze, we were mere pawns in this deadly game. The sense of being watched intensified, an invisible gaze that seemed to penetrate our souls. Shadows danced at the corners of our vision, fleeting apparitions that disappeared as we turned to face them. An icy shiver slithered down our spines, freezing our breath in anticipation of an unseen threat. Time lost its meaning in this nocturnal labyrinth. The hours blended together as trepidation clung to our every step. Exhaustion weighed heavily upon us as the darkness persisted, our energy sapped by the relentless pursuit of escape. We fought against mounting despair, holding on to the flickering hope that guided us forward. Through the dense thicket and undergrowth, we trudged onward, hands tightly clasped, seeking solace in each other's presence. Our shared determination tethered us against the encroaching terror fortifying our spirits in this seemingly never-ending nightmare. Cold tendrils of fear wound themselves around our hearts, strangling our courage and threatening to choke out any remnants of hope. Doubt crept into our thoughts, whispering insidious words into our ears. Were we destined to wander these woods forever, trapped in a loop of despair and terror? Each step forward became a desperate bid for survival, a silent plea to the impassive forest to relinquish its grip on our souls. Time became both fleeting and eternal, the weight of the unknown bearing down on us with unforgiving persistence. The forest offered no answers, only relentless mysteries that taunted our fraying sanity. Unbeknownst to us, our presence had not gone unnoticed. Unseen by our eyes, a presence lurked in the shadows, sensing our vulnerability and seeking to exploit it. The ancient woods held secrets, and we had unwittingly stumbled upon one of the darkest. Suddenly, the rustling of leaves stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that hung heavily in the air. In that moment, a figure emerged from the depths of the forest, an indistinct shape that seemed to blur the line between man and beast. It moved with an unsettling grace, its form shifting and contorting like liquid darkness. Fear seized our hearts as we realized we were face to face with a skinwalker, a being of ancient lore with the ability to take on the appearance of any creature it desired. Its eyes shone with a malevolent glow, reflecting our own terror back at us. Panic surged within us, urging us to run, but our legs felt as though they were rooted to the ground. The skinwalker's gaze held us captive, its intentions unknown but undeniably sinister. Stay calm, I whispered to Melissa, feeling the weight of responsibility settle upon my shoulders. We need to be smart and find a way to protect ourselves. Melissa nodded, her eyes locked on the creature. Together we frantically searched for any means of defense. Our backpacks held only the typical camping supplies, insufficient against a supernatural foe. As if sensing our desperation, the skinwalker lunged forward, its speed and agility defying human capabilities. Adrenaline coursed through our veins as we dodged its advance, barely escaping its clutches. The creature's guttural growls echoed through the forest, sending a chill down our spines. We retreated, putting distance between ourselves and the skinwalker, seeking refuge in the thick underbrush. Heart pounding, we desperately brainstormed a plan, our minds racing to find a strategy that would keep us alive. As we continued through the woods, our hearts raced with a mixture of fear and determination. The encounter with the skinwalker had shaken us to our core, leaving us on edge, constantly scanning our surroundings for any sign of danger. Melissa and I knew we had to move quickly, reluctant to linger in one place for too long. As we pressed on, desperate to put distance between ourselves and the lurking threat, a cacophony of snapping branches and rustling leaves pierced the silence. We froze, our eyes widening in dread. Without a word, we instinctively knew it was time to run. Panicked footsteps pounded against the forest floor, 
our breaths ragged as adrenaline surged through our veins. We dashed through the underbrush, each desperate leap carrying us further away from imminent danger. The forest distorted around us, resembling a nightmarish labyrinth that sought to confound our escape. Trees seemingly shifted positions, creating a disorienting maze that threatened to engulf us. The treacherous terrain sent us stumbling and tripping, but the desperation to survive fueled our determination. In the chaos and confusion, we lost sight of one another. Melissa's presence faded into the darkness, leaving me disoriented and alone. Panic consumed me as I called out her name, my voice drowned by the overwhelming silence of the forest. Forced to make a choice, I hurriedly decided to continue moving, hoping that Melissa would do the same. Fear clung to my thoughts, but I reassured myself that she possessed the strength and resilience to endure. A part of me believed that our bond would guide us back to each other. Flashlight in hand, I pressed on, relentless in my pursuit of safety. Every shadowed corner held the potential danger of the unknown. But I pushed back the rising fear and focused on finding a way out of this nightmarish realm. Hours turned into an eternity as I traversed in complete solitude. The forest seemed to swallow me whole, its ancient whispers becoming a haunting soundtrack to my journey. Doubt and guilt gnawed at my mind, tinged with the uncertainty of Melissa's fate. Questions plagued me. Had she encountered more peril, or had she found her way to safety? My steps became heavy, fatigue beginning to wear down my resolve. Doubts threatened to overtake me as the weight of the situation bore down on my shoulders. But then, a glimmer of hope pierced the darkness, a faint glow ahead, like a beacon of salvation. With renewed vigor, I hastened toward the light, yearning for the respite it promised. As I drew closer, the glow revealed itself to be the soft radiance of a moonlit clearing. A sense of cautious relief washed over me, but the knowledge that Melissa was not by my side cast a shadow over my relief. I took a moment to catch my breath, basking in the cool evening air. As I scanned my surroundings, a tattered piece of cloth caught my attention. It hung from a nearby tree branch, its fabric torn and weathered. My heart skipped a beat as I recognized it as a fragment of Melissa's hoodie. A mixture of apprehension and hope flooded my senses, uncertain of what this discovery meant. Had Melissa passed this way? Had she encountered danger or found temporary refuge? The questions taunted my weary mind, urging me to find answers. Resolutely, I made the decision to search for any further signs or clues that would lead me closer to Melissa's whereabouts. I gathered the fragment of cloth, holding it close as a talisman of hope. With the moonlight as my guide, I plunged back into the forest, determined to unmask the secrets hidden within its depths and reunite with Melissa. As I retraced my steps through the dense forest, a sense of unease settled in my chest. The minutes turned into hours as I called out Melissa's name, but there was no sign of her. Anxiety gnawed at me, and I couldn't shake the nagging thought that something sinister may have befallen her. Pushing fear aside, I pressed on, determined to leave no stone unturned in my search for Melissa. Every rustle of leaves or snap of twigs inflated my heart rate, as if amplifying my awareness of the lurking dangers around me. Yet I couldn't let fear paralyze me. Melissa needed me, and I needed to find her. The moon cast its ethereal glow upon the forest, illuminating my path and guiding my steps. Even as hope flickered within me, a voice in the back of my mind reminded me that time was slipping away. The night was growing colder, and the darkness seemed to thicken as I ventured deeper. With each passing moment, a sense of urgency ignited within me. I switched my focus from calling out her name to meticulously scouring the surroundings, examining every nook and cranny for any signs of her presence. Yet, as my search intensified, the presence of the skinwalkers weighed heavily on my thoughts. At some point, I stumbled upon a clearing, bathed in moonlight and seemingly untouched by the eerie stillness of the forest. My heart raced with anticipation, hoping that this would be the moment I found Melissa safe and sound. But as I stepped closer, my hope dissolved into disappointment. The clearing was serene, 
devoid of any trace of Melissa. A deep sigh left my lips, mingling with the whispers of the wind. Doubt began to consume me once again. Was it possible that the skinwalkers had taken her? The uncertainty gnawed at my core, but I couldn't allow myself to succumb to despair. I had to keep searching, adapt, and find a way to bring Melissa back. As I pressed on through the treacherous darkness of the forest, my determination to find Melissa burned fiercely within me. Every step forward seemed to carry an air of anticipation, as if the forest itself held its breath, whispering secrets just beyond my reach. Suddenly, a rustling sound echoed through the trees, causing my heart to skip a beat. I spun around, my flashlight cutting through the gloom, and there, illuminated in its beam, were the unmistakable figures of the skinwalkers. Fear surged within me, threatening to paralyze my every move, but I couldn't afford to succumb to it. Melissa's safety depended on my courage and swift action. With a deep breath, I mustered my resolve and faced the dark figures, ready to confront them head on. The skinwalkers moved with an eerie grace, their shapes shifting and twisting in the flickering light. In my mind, I conjured memories of the stories told about their malevolence and their dangerous abilities. I knew I had to be cautious, to protect myself while also trying to find a way to free Melissa from their clutches. As I took a step forward, they lunged at me, their eyes glowing with a haunting intensity. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I dodged their advance, my senses heightened, desperately searching for an opening. With each evasive maneuver, I moved closer to Melissa, determined to set her free. A chaotic dance ensued, the forest becoming a battleground between the skinwalkers and me. Branches snapped underfoot, leaves rustled, and the moon bore witness to our struggle. Time seemed to stretch, every second a testament to my resilience and unwavering love for Melissa. Finally, seizing a momentary distraction, I broke free from the clutches of the skinwalkers and raced towards a secluded spot where Melissa was held captive. Her eyes met mine, a mix of fear and hope shining within them. Silently, I reassured her that help had arrived. Carefully, I untied the ropes that bound her, our hands trembling but filled with determination. We didn't have a moment to spare. As we made our escape through the dense forest, the skinwalkers pursued us relentlessly, their dark forms never far behind. With each step, our desperation grew, propelling us forward. We navigated through tangled thickets, jumped over fallen trees, and pushed our bodies to the limit. But a small sliver of hope still burned within us, urging us to keep going. Finally, as the first glimpses of dawn painted the sky, we emerged from the depths of the forest. We gasped for breath, our lungs heaving with exhaustion and relief. We had made it. Together, we stumbled back to where we had parked our car, the sense of freedom overwhelming us. We collapsed into the seats, our bodies exhausted but our spirits soaring. The encounter with the skinwalkers had only strengthened our bond, solidifying the depths of our love and the resilience of our will. As I turned the ignition and the car roared to life, Melissa reached out, her hand finding mine. We shared a knowing glance, a silent promise that no matter what challenges lay ahead, we would face them united. Days had passed since our escape from the haunting depths of the forest, and Melissa and I attempted to resume a semblance of normalcy. Yet a sense of underlying unease lingered within me, casting a shadow of doubt over our newfound freedom. Subtle changes in Melissa's behavior caught my attention. There were moments when her gaze seemed distant, filled with an otherworldly longing. Her movements became more fluid, her grace seemingly beyond human capabilities. It was as if an invisible barrier stood between us, creating an unsettling disconnect. The weight of uncertainty pressed upon my chest as I looked into Melissa's eyes, longing for a connection that no longer seemed attainable. Yet, it was the way she stared through me, as if gazing into a void beyond my existence, that sent shivers down my spine. The warmth and familiarity that once radiated from her gaze had been replaced by something chillingly distant, leaving me feeling like a stranger in her presence. In the depths of my soul, a chilling realization began to take hold. 
an eerie understanding that the forest had not stolen Melissa away, but instead it had birthed something far more sinister. As the whispers of the wind carried an unsettling melody, I couldn't escape the bone-chilling truth that the woman I once knew, the love of my life, had become a haunting presence, an embodiment of the very darkness that had lurked in the depths of those woods. I stood at the southern terminus of the Pacific Crest Trail in Campo, California, the morning sun casting long shadows across the arid landscape. The air was already warm, hinting at the scorching heat to come. This was it, the beginning of a journey that would stretch over 2,600 miles to Canada, a path I'd dreamed of since Kate first told me her stories of the wild. The desert stretched before me, an expanse of sand and scrub that seemed to dare me forward. With each step, my boots kicked up small clouds of dust, and the weight of my backpack settled into a familiar, if not entirely comfortable, presence on my shoulders. I had prepared for this, trained for it, but nothing quite compares to the moment you actually embark on a journey that's been a mere fantasy for so long. Rattlesnakes were my first real challenge. I'd hear the ominous rattle, a sound that cuts right through the silence of the desert, sending shivers down my spine. I learned quickly to give them a wide berth, respecting their place in this harsh landscape. The desert, I realized, wasn't just a physical challenge, it was a mental one. The vastness could be overwhelming, the silence deafening. It wasn't all harsh sun and silent deserts, though. There were moments of incredible beauty, sunrises that painted the sky in hues of orange and pink, the surprising burst of wildflowers after a rare rain, the way the stars seemed to multiply tenfold at night, unobscured by city lights. These moments made every hardship worth it. On the 53rd day, I reached Kennedy Meadows, a milestone for every PCT hiker. This was where the desert gave way to the Sierra Nevada, where the landscape would change dramatically, and where I could take a short but much needed break. My body was weary, but my spirit was undeterred. I sat by the side of the trail, pulling off my boots and feeling the grass beneath my feet. A simple pleasure after days of nothing but sand and rock. Kennedy Meadows was a hive of activity, a stark contrast to the solitude I had become accustomed to. Other hikers buzzed around, sharing stories, advice, and food. I listened, absorbing their tales and tips, but a part of me yearned for the solitude of the trail. There's something about being alone out there, with nothing but your thoughts and the wilderness around you, that changes you. It strips away the unnecessary, leaving only what's essential. As I set out again, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease, a sense that this next leg of my journey would be different. The forests I entered after Kennedy Meadows held a silence that was eerie, a stillness that seemed to hint at something more. I pushed these thoughts aside, focusing on the path ahead, but they lingered in the back of my mind, like a shadow just out of sight. I thought of Kate then, of her stories and her warnings. The trail teaches you, she had said, I was beginning to understand what she meant, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the most important lessons were yet to come. Yosemite National Park welcomed me with its grandeur, a stark contrast to the arid deserts I had left behind. The towering trees and the verdant valleys seemed like another world, one that was lush, alive, and teeming with secrets. I hiked on, feeling small beneath the ancient redwoods, their trunks like sentinels guarding the mysteries of the wild. A week into this leg of the journey, the trail began to feel different. It was subtle at first, a rustle in the underbrush, a fleeting shadow at the edge of my vision. I brushed it off as the tricks the mind plays when you've been alone for too long. But the feeling of being watched grew stronger, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck that I couldn't shake off. One evening, I reached a campsite, a rare gathering of fellow hikers sharing stories around a crackling fire. The camaraderie was a welcome change, but as night fell and I lay in my tent, the forest around us fell eerily silent. Then, out of the silence, I heard it, a voice, distant and ethereal, calling my name. I sat up, heart pounding, but when I peered out there was nothing but the dark, dense forest. 
The next few days passed without incident, the strange occurrences seeming like nothing but figments of my imagination. But the sense of unease lingered, like a cold wind that you can't escape. Then, as I navigated a particularly rocky stretch of the trail, I twisted my ankle. The pain was sharp and immediate, forcing me to stop. I found a solitary campsite to rest, setting up my tent with difficulty. My ankle throbbed, a constant reminder of my vulnerability. As the sun set, the forest around me took on an ominous feel. The trees seemed to close in, and the sounds of the forest grew quieter, as if in anticipation. That night, as I lay awake nursing my ankle, I heard the voice again. This time, it was closer, more insistent. A pleading tone that sent chills down my spine. I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped my tent, and peered into the darkness. What I saw in the beam of my light shook me to my core. A figure, humanoid but not human, standing at the edge of the clearing. It didn't speak, but it didn't need to. Its presence was enough to fill me with an overwhelming sense of dread. It circled my tent, leaving behind footprints that were unlike any animal I knew. I stayed awake all night, flashlight in hand, heart racing. As soon as the first light of dawn broke through the trees, I packed up my gear, ignoring the pain in my ankle. I needed to get to the nearest town, to safety. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snap of a twig, had me looking over my shoulder. I didn't know what that figure was, but I knew I didn't want to encounter it again. The journey to the town was a blur of pain and fear, but as the buildings came into view, I felt a surge of relief. I had escaped the forest and whatever lurked within it, but the memory of that night and the haunting, mocking figure would stay with me long after my ankle had healed. The town was a haven, a place to heal, both my ankle and my frayed nerves. People went about their daily lives oblivious to the darkness that lurked in the forests just beyond. I spent days there, resting and recovering, the image of that figure never quite leaving the corners of my mind. But I couldn't stay in the safety of the town forever. The trail called to me, an unfinished chapter in my life that I needed to close. With a mix of trepidation and determination, I set out again, my ankles still tender but manageable. The forests of Yosemite awaited, and with them, the unknown. As I hiked, the memory of the figure weighed heavily on me. Every shadow seemed to move, every whisper of wind sounded like a voice. The wilderness had lost its innocence. It now felt like a realm where anything was possible, where the lines between reality and myth blurred. Then, on a cool, starless night, it happened again. The voice, Closer this time, more desperate. It pleaded, called out in a tone that was almost human, but not quite. I couldn't ignore it anymore. I had to face whatever this was, confront my fear. With my flashlight in hand, I stepped out of my tent. The forest was eerily still, as if holding its breath. I called out, asking who was there, demanding an answer. But there was only silence, and then a laugh, low and mocking that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. That's when I saw it, the figure circling my tent again. This time, I got a better look. It was tall, its body humanoid but distorted, its movements unnatural. As it moved through the beam of my flashlight, it seemed to flicker, like a bad signal on a TV. Its eyes, though, were the most disturbing, intensely human, filled with an emotion I couldn't place. I stood my ground, fear and fascination battling within me. The figure stopped circling and stood still, as if considering me. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished into the forest. The silence that followed was deafening. I didn't sleep that night. As dawn broke, I packed up and moved on, every step fueled by a need to leave that place behind. But the encounter stayed with me, haunting my thoughts. What was it? a figment of my imagination, a creature of folklore. I had no answers, only more questions. As the days passed and I moved further away from Yosemite, the encounters stopped. The forest gradually returned to the tranquil refuge I had known before, but the experience had changed me. I was more alert, 
more aware of the thin veil between the known and the unknown. When I finally reached the end of the trail, I felt a sense of accomplishment, but also a lingering sense of unease. I had completed my journey, but the mystery of what I had encountered remained unsolved, a puzzle that I couldn't quite put together. And somewhere, in the depths of the forest, I knew that figure still roamed, a reminder of the mysteries that lie hidden in the wild places of the world. The days after my encounter in Yosemite were a mix of relief and reflection. I had faced something inexplicable, something that defied logic and understanding, but the trail was still there, winding its way through the wilderness, and I had a journey to complete. As I resumed my hike, the shadow of that figure lingered in my mind. Yet, the trail had a way of soothing fears, of putting things into perspective. The rhythm of walking, the beauty of the changing landscape, the challenge of each mile, it all helped to push the fear to the back of my mind. I hiked through the lush forests of Oregon, marveled at the volcanic landscapes of Washington, each step taking me further from my fears and closer to my goal. The trail was no longer just a physical journey, it had become a path to inner strength. I learned to trust my instincts, to listen to the subtle whispers of the wild, and to respect the unknown. The encounters stopped, but their memory didn't fade. I found myself looking over my shoulder less, my nights less fraught with anxiety. The wild had tested me, and I had emerged stronger, more resilient. The beauty of the Pacific Crest Trail is in its diversity, deserts, forests, mountains, and rivers. Each day brought a new scenery, a new challenge. I crossed rushing streams, climbed steep passes, and walked through fields of wildflowers. The trail was both my adversary and my companion, and I had grown to love it. As the days passed, Canada drew closer. The anticipation of reaching the end, of completing this epic journey, was both exciting and bittersweet. I had grown during this journey, not just as a hiker, but as a person. The trail had taught me about solitude, about facing fears, about the beauty and mystery of the natural world. Finally, the day arrived. I stood at the northern terminus of the Pacific Crest Trail, a simple wooden monument marking the end of a journey that had changed me in ways I was still trying to understand. I felt a surge of emotions, pride, relief, a sense of accomplishment, but also a hint of sadness. The trail had been my home for months, and leaving it behind was like saying goodbye to an old friend. As I made my way back to civilization, back to the noise and bustle of everyday life, I carried with me the memories of the trail, the beauty, the challenges, and even the fear. The encounter in Yosemite remained a mystery, one that I pondered often. Was it a figment of my imagination? A creature of folklore? I didn't have the answers, but the experience had opened my mind to possibilities I had never considered before. I returned home with more than just stories and photographs. I came back with a newfound respect for the wild, a deeper understanding of myself, and a lingering curiosity about the mysteries that lie hidden in the remote corners of the world. The trail had ended, but the journey, in many ways, was just beginning. Back in the comfort of my home, the Pacific Crest Trail felt like a distant dream, a surreal blend of beauty and fear. I had completed an epic journey, one that left its mark on me in ways I was still unraveling. The familiar surroundings of my house seemed strangely foreign after months on the trail. I found myself missing the simplicity of life on the trail, the clarity that comes with facing each day as a single, straightforward challenge. The memory of that figure in Yosemite lingered, a haunting presence in the back of my mind. I couldn't let it go, couldn't chalk it up to mere fatigue or imagination. I found myself spending hours researching, diving into forums and books about folklore and unexplained phenomena. Skinwalkers, wendigos, names and stories from different cultures that spoke of beings that were neither human nor animal, that walked the thin line between the physical world and something else. I was a rational person, always had been, but what I had experienced on the trail challenged that rationality. It opened a door to a world of possibilities I had never considered. 
I read accounts of hikers and campers who had experienced similar encounters, each story adding to the mystery, deepening my curiosity. Despite my research, answers were elusive. The more I read, the more I realized that some things just can't be explained, at least not by conventional understanding. The wilderness is vast, and it holds secrets that were perhaps not meant to understand. I had to accept that my encounter might remain a mystery, a piece of the puzzle of the natural world that didn't quite fit. I began to share my story with others, especially with those planning to hike the PCT. Not to scare them, but to prepare them. The trail, for all its beauty, could be unpredictable, challenging not just your physical strength but your mental resilience. I emphasize the importance of safety, of being aware of your surroundings, and of respecting the wilderness and its mysteries. As time passed, the intensity of the experience faded, but it never completely left me. I found myself looking at the world differently, with a sense of wonder and a healthy respect for the unknown. The trail had changed me in many ways. It had taught me about my own strength and vulnerability, about the beauty of the natural world, and about the thin line between reality and the unknown. Sometimes late at night, I'd find myself thinking back to that figure in the forest, wondering what it was and why it had come to me. The experience had left me with more questions than answers, but it also left me with a profound sense of awe for the natural world and its mysteries. The Pacific Crest Trail was behind me, but the journey it started continued. It was a journey of discovery, not just of the world around me, but of myself. And as I sat there, Looking out my window at the familiar streets, I knew that a part of me would always be out there, walking the trail, searching for answers, and marveling at the wonders of the wild.